This podcast has mature language, not intended for underage viewers. Street Cred Sports. Street Cred Sports. Uh, I'm crossing over. I'm Euro stepping. Hello, this is Keenan of Street Cred Sports Training, and welcome to another episode of Time to Ball. This is episode 19 for my Patreon people. How y'all doing out there? I hope everybody's doing lovely. I really do. I really do. Uh, It's getting closer to spring. I know some people can't wait for the time to be moved. I get confused if it's if it's moving ahead or turning back. All I know is at some point it's not dark at six or seven or eight o'clock. It's still light outside, which which I really like. I, I, I if I had my choice, I would keep it light like that year round. Here's why is because sometimes you have people who are out, you know, and they happen to be caught out. Like my, my wife doesn't like to drive late and she got, you know, she was out afterwards and, you know, it, it wasn't a fun experience for her. Then you have, you know, moms or females who are out and, you know, they're by themselves and stuff. So if it's light out, they would feel more comfortable you know, stuff like that. You probably have less uh, incidents at night because some people don't like to drive and everything. But if I had to, if I had to choose, I would definitely rather have it being late, like, like getting dark later. That's just my personal opinion. I mean, there are things about it being late earlier, yeah, as well. But overall, yeah, it's it's better for me, I think. And then I think Arizona, their their time, their stuff doesn't change at all. <laughs> there is no time. So it's like it's always the same time. So if I'm going up to Arizona to visit some of the coaches or scouts, and I'm and they always ask me, well, what time is it there? And I have to say, uh, what time is it there? And they tell me, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, now nah, we're behind. Or I think right now we're at the same time as, as it is in Arizona. But then it'll change, and I think we'll be an hour, be a hot, an hour ahead or something. So. It's it's just kind of weird at how that is, and I think it it's almost like the whole United States should just have the same time, you know. But then, like seven o'clock in California would be different seven o'clock in New York. So I get I get the whole thing, but yeah, yeah, that's just it's just weird with with the time change, and you know, and I'm sure it's going to be happening in the next few months. Uh, so let me get to my things on my mind. Okay, so uh, what I want to talk about is a company called Overtime Sports, and I saw them. Uh, they they were it was like a clip. They were talking about Overtime Sports and how it's grown in such popularity because it does a lot of highlights and stuff, and kids watch. And I I I, I think it's a great idea because they they understand the algorithm. Uh, of uh in the system of you know the attention spans and i guess the attention span of people today they don't want to look at something for a long period of time so they don't want to watch a whole film they'd rather just watch the quote-unquote relevant parts of a game highlights and you know they do it well so kudos to them I'm, i'm not knocking them but my question is uh is this a bad thing to just let kids watch clips of games. I, I think it's a bad thing if that's the only way kids consume uh, the sport that they're trying to play. Because you have to have context. You know, you see this one move and it's a highlight move. And it's like, oh my God, did you see that move? Yeah, that's a good move. But why don't you see how that play started? So you can see how that that uh, offensive player got to where he or she wanted to get to, to make that outstanding play. And then there's so many other moving parts. So when, when you're watching games, I always get on my kids and I tell them, you need to watch basketball games, full games, because you're going to see everything that we actually do. And, and I'm going to tell you this, it almost makes the hair stand up on on my arms and the back of my neck as I think about this. But 100% of the time, Whenever I've worked on a kid with a kid and then a basketball game was on and we go in there as they're leaving and I say, watch, let's see if we see something that we did within two within a minute of them watching. 
they see something that we ex that we were working on, whether it was a high level move or whether it was something simple like a pick or or, or rebound or, or proper way of shooting a free throw. Whatever it is, they see it and they say, "Hey, he just did the move." Like, yeah. And if you watch more basketball, you would see it and understand why I'm telling you to do it. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's 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 okay to watch clips of games obviously if you if you're in a situation where you can't watch a whole game then yeah but you need to watch a whole game here's another reason why when college coaches and scouts are are looking into kids you can put up a highlight film now what is a highlight film a highlight film is usually highlights of the person's strengths right now, if you're a shooter, you don't want to have a three-minute highlight film of all you're doing is shooting, catching and shooting. You always want to have balance and have other things going on, showing you rebounding, showing you passing, showing you play defense, you know, uh, showing you handling the ball. Maybe you're getting somebody else a shot. You want to show a variety of things because even if that's all you do and you're great at it, you get in the game and somebody's able to take that away from you, which they will, you better know how to do something else. Okay. So what I tell kids is a highlight is like the carrot. It's the teaser. It's the teaser trailer. It lets them know what the movie's going to be about. So they get excited, but you got to let them have a whole game film. For me, I like to watch the whole game film because I like to see all the moving parts, see what they're doing when they don't have the ball, see how they're, how they're looking uh, defensively, what they're supposed to be doing, see how they're running the play how they're communicating with their teammates, all of those things. Those are important to, to coaches because they can't have players come in that they have to teach all of that to from scratch. Yeah, they have. there's a form of teaching because they're, you know, it's different stuff, uh, different language, different, uh, different movements, ways that they want you to close out or, or cut or, and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it's different, but you have to watch. And, and the funniest thing, <laughs> I know it's slightly off subject, but when watching film, one of the funniest things that happens is when I tell parents, hey, you know, well, uh, you know, film the game and bring it up here. Because sometimes and with us, the kid is saying one thing and the parent is saying another. So they're at odds. And I always tell them, just bring me the film because the film don't lie. One of y'all going to be right. <laughs> One of y'all is going to be wrong once I watch that film. But the funny thing is some parents, when they bring me film, they're filming their kid. So, like, the the camera is, like, zoomed in on their kid. So, if their kid is standing there, I can't see anything, <laughs> anything else going on in the game. And I have to tell them, no, 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 I need you to film the whole side of the court so I can see why they're just standing there why they're not moving and the, and, the, and the parents are usually like oh okay and look it's not just the moms i've had dads who do it i've had grandmas who do it grandpas that do it uncles and aunts sisters and brothers i've had it all that brought the film and i had to tell them, no 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 i need the whole game because right now it looks like it's just a spotlight on the kid like he the dancing you don't know what is that noise all i see is him standing there and there's nothing else he's standing in the corner why are there a lot of noise? Where is he at? <laughs> Why is he wearing a jersey? <laughs> so, yeah, you have to have context. And by having context, it lets you know what you're looking for. Because whenever parents bring film and I'm able to look at it, I'm able to quickly stop and show them, like, what were you thinking here? Why, why didn't you move here? Or, hey, that was a good cut or that was a good play. I could see that you were reading, you know, what was going on. And, and it reinforces what we try to teach and what they're doing. So, yeah, uh, overtime sports, I think, is, uh, is is doing a phenomenal job for what their business model holds. But I think the danger in it is we're getting into a microwave society. We don't want to watch. We don't want to put that turkey on for 10 minutes. I mean, not 10 minutes, for four hours to cook. We want to put it on for, for a minute and a half. You know, and it's got to be ready. So we, we, we got to find balance. Look at these clips when you can, but we need to see more. Now, how do you find a happy medium? Maybe instead of a 30-second clip, they show, like, you know, the rebound. You know, 
in, in going into the play, whether it's walking up, they show a longer version of it and then maybe break it down. But I don't know. I, I haven't looked at overtime in a while, but uh, I'm not sure if they do that or not. Some some institutions, when they're showing the film and stuff and highlights of this magnificent play, sometimes they'll start it from the rebound. Others will just show that play. So uh, I think we need to have balance. So hopefully you guys out there are trying to consume more than just highlights. Okay, now to my training basketball ideology. What is my basketball training ideology? Yeah, I, I switched the words. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk about dealing with double teams or face guarding. Okay, so I've had kids that have, you know, they're they're the top kid on their team. And, you know, and sometimes they say, hey, what are, they're taking me out of the game because they're face guarding or they're trying to double team me. Now, me personally, you know, growing up when I was playing, that 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 didn't happen. Like, yeah, no, you're not going to stop me from getting the ball. I'm going to go get the ball. I don't care what you do. Unless, unless you just grab me and tackle me to the ground and three or four of y'all lay on top of me to keep me from moving, that might be how you're stopping me. But ain't no one person or two people going to stop me from getting the ball. You can try. You know, now, of course, you could do it now because I'm slow as dirt right now. Although I think I'm fast when I'm doing the drill. They'd be like, man, that's fast. But I don't, I don't know if it's fast like what I think it is. But but in any case, I, I never had if I wanted the ball, I was going to go get it. So for me, the first thing that I would tell kids is you have to be aggressive and go get the ball. That's the first thing. You got to be aggressive and you go get the ball. OK. But having said that, there are ways. So let's look at it from this standpoint. If the ball is on the top of the key and um, I'm on the left side, let's say I'm on the left side, which if you're facing the goal, it's the right side. So I'll just say right side. So I don't want to confuse nobody like or myself. If I'm on the right side of the court and uh, the defender is standing in between uh, myself and, and the ball handler, and they're not trying to deny. It. They're just full out. I'm in front of you. You're not going to be able to catch the ball. If there's nobody in that corner on that right side, you know, you can just kind of post them, post them by uh, standing in front like like they're fronting you, and then allow them to throw the ball over to a spot not to you, but to a spot where you can go catch and shoot or make your move. Now, obviously, you can't have anybody in that corner. Because then it, it will actually um, uh, make that area congested. That's that's a way that you can get the ball over. It's best kind of by posting and calling for the ball to be thrown over them. Because they're not, sometimes they're not going to be facing the ball. They're going to be facing you. Now, if they're facing the ball, it's, it doesn't really matter because you can still move uh, to get the ball. A uh, second way, if they're face guarding you on the perimeter, you know, you can use your body to get in front of them, call for the ball and signal that you want them to throw the ball slightly out so you can hop out and get the ball. OK, uh, when it's a double team, it's really just about being physical and using uh, those two players uh, defensive intensity against them because they're not going to move at the same time. So if you determine it's you're going to make a sudden move. They're not going to react both at the same time, right? One might react faster than the other. So you can move one and then get in front of the other, depending on how they're trying to uh, uh, double team. you. Now, obviously, if it's on a trap, you have to be mindful of, of coming to the ball in the trap, because if you come to the ball and they pass it to you, you know, you, you might end up being close to the baseline or baseline in, in the sideline. So now, You've, you've uh, put yourself in a bad position of being trapped and, and you're going to have to throw it away or try to throw it off their leg to save the possession. But, uh, you know, instead of setting up at the free throw line, I would try to set up higher and then just try to make a quick move. You know, I, I went, I'm not, I'm sorry, I wouldn't try, but I'd make a quick move, be physical with the other defender and come to the ball, but leave myself room to, to go. Once you catch the ball, you can't catch it and just be thinking about what you're going to do. You should at that point know 
how you want to attack it because traps don't like to be attacked. They like to do the attacking. Uh, so when it comes to face guarding or dealing with traps, uh, you really want to make sure that, you know, you're clearing out uh, parts of the court so you can catch the ball at where you want it. And after in a zone, obviously it makes it a little bit more difficult, but it's just you have to, you know, you want them to throw the ball to an open spot. Or if their person is trying to sandwich you, then you just come to the ball. That's usually what you want to do. If they're fronting you or face guarding you on the uh, post, it's the same thing. It's just a different angle. And obviously you want to be able to have a, a player that's good enough to throw the ball where you need it. And you can practice that, you know, with your team. It's like, hey, when they do this or they were doing this, you know, when this happens, if this happens again, you know, this is where I want the ball. You know, what do you feel comfortable in doing it? And, and then you get that communication and you can, you know, create opportunities to be successful. Uh, but that's pretty much what what it is. And and I'll try to to get some video and information out there to try to help those who have been struggling with those things. But that's that's the basketball training ideology or training basketball ideology. <laughs> All right, so last thing is I want to discuss Sunday drivers. What the hell is a Sunday driver? I remember, uh, it was this cartoon. Some of y'all might not even know it. It was called the Flintstones. I used to love the Flintstones. I still don't know how the hell he was able to paddle the car with his feet. And then he running, and then all of a sudden he puts his feet up, and then the car doesn't stop. There was no type of engine or real engine in there, per se. But, yo, it made it work. I loved that show. I used to love watching that show and eating a bowl of cereal back when I was younger. I mean, it was really one. That one, the Jetsons. Man, I was a cartoon person. You know, I, I love watching cartoons. But in any case, uh, I want to say I, it was either the Jetsons or or the Flintstones. And I'll have to look it up to see which one it was. But it was one of those two. And they were driving. And then they said, watch where you're going, you Sunday driver. You know, and I'm you kind of chuckle and laugh by the way he says it when you're young. It's like, oh, that was funny. <laughs> but I didn't know what it was, right? And then, you know, I think I heard my dad saying, them, them goddamn Sunday drivers be driving me crazy. So then as you get older, I'm like, whoa. What is a Sunday driver? Then I kind of heard like, well, you know, these are people who on Sundays, they they're relaxing. So they're never in a hurry to go anywhere. So when they're driving on the road or on the freeway, uh, they usually don't go to speed limit. They're usually, you know, five or maybe 10 miles, you know, below the speed limit. And they, you know, they tend to stay in one, you know, one particular lane. Although now, you know, those Sunday drivers are driving seven days a week, <laughs> not just driving on Sundays. But I remember, you know, I remember it. I was driving and I was on the freeway. And, OK, your boy might have been going faster than 60. I wasn't like speeding, speeding. I wasn't going faster than like 65. Right. I, I mean, because I looked down. When, when this happened, but I was coming up on a vehicle like super fast. So I had to look to see like, damn, am I flying? Cause I'm coming up on them really fast. And I was like, no, I was only going like, you know, by this time I took my foot kind of off the pedal, but it was at like 64. So I was like, okay, you know, I wasn't going too, too fast, but that car is probably going way below. Right. So as I passed them, I was like, uh, you know, you slow down instinctively to make sure you're not driving into anything. And, you know, I passed them really fast and I'm looking at my speedometer and it had went to 58 before I put my foot back on the gas. But I'm gone past them. And I was like, man, they probably going like 40, 45 miles an hour. But as you pass them, it's, you know, and, and this isn't a knock at that, that on this particular instance, it was an older couple. You know, and they were just, they looked like they were just, hey, they were enjoying the day driving. And that's when it hit me. That's a Sunday driver. <laughs> that's a Sunday driver. They're just driving. You know, they, they don't, they don't, you don't have a care in the world. And then you have to think about it. It's like, you know, 
uh, you get two days off. Well, I don't, but you know, you get two days off and Sunday's like the day of rest, you know, uh, religiously, uh, you know, it's the day you're supposed to rest on the seven day and stuff. And, you know, a lot of times you're not supposed to do much, you know, and you, but enjoy life, enjoy your family and all of that stuff. So then you have, uh, you know, people that, Hey, let's take a drive. Let's drive around the city and just roll the windows down and enjoy the clean air, you know, and put on some tunes and reminisce and, you know, and that's kind of what the, what, what a Sunday driver does, but everybody else is driving like it's Monday. <laughs> Everybody's driving like it's Monday and, and, and they're driving like they're late they're, that they were supposed to be at work at eight and it is now eight twenty six. <laughs> And if they were late one more time, they're going to get fired. So that's how most people drive now. And and that's what a Sunday driver is. It It is, it, it, you know, it, it's odd because you don't understand it. And I try not to be the one getting upset with people. Now, what I will tell you is I really think people should drive at least the speed limit. Okay. I'm not saying you got to speed, but you shouldn't be driving too far under. And there are, to me, that's what causes wrecks. You know, obviously people driving way over the speed limit, but then you're trying to avoid somebody that's driving. If you're driving 80 miles per hour on, the, on a 60 mile per hour uh, freeway, you're driving 80 and then this other car is driving 40. Your, your chances of hitting that car are high before you can adjust because you're not understanding why that car is going that slow, right? So... Uh, I think there needs to be a happy medium. And I know that, you know, you even have Sunday drivers that drive in the left lane <laughs> and, and they go below 60 and they don't move. You have to move around them no matter how time, how many times people are bunking their horn and yelling at them. Hey, it's Sunday. I'm a Sunday driver. I'm just chilling. So when you're out on the roadway on a Sunday, be extra careful, you know, or hell, maybe not. Because you might be the Sunday driver. I think I was a Sunday driver once. I was driving home and I was like, oh, I'm going like 56 and it's a 60 and cars were passing me. And I was like, oh, I was, I was in my Sunday driver mode right now. You know, let me speed up a little bit. I'm not trying to get anybody hurt. <laughs> but look, that's going to be all for today. Uh, I hope everything was uh, beneficial to you. Like I said, I'll be trying to put up some information or some videos detailing the face guarding and dealing with double teams uh, for you to see it. So uh, with all of that, I'm going to end as I always do. Uh, if it was easy, everyone will be doing it. Out. Street cred sports. Say it with your chest. Yeah, yeah. Go get it from the net. Street cred sports. Okay, that's a 